1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, I am not exaggerating when I say this might be one of the most important messages, or at least the, the, the subject of this message might be one of the most important out of the whole uh, series in 1 Corinthians. Now, there's a lot of important things in 1 Corinthians, but these truths here that we find in these, uh, in these verses is just tremendously, tremendously important. And um, really, I was thinking, you know, there's several here, uh, not here because of the, the snow. And I was thinking it almost, it'd be important enough that I could preach this today, and I could even preach it next week, just preach the same message next week, and it would be that important. Now, it's not important because I'm preaching it. It's important because it's the Word of God, and it's important because of what the subject of this is. But it is so vital in the Christian life to understand this, these truths because it is vital to, li to, to live a, a victorious Christian life uh, that pleases the Lord, that is led by the Lord. And so let's start reading at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. I don't think I'll preach it next week, but now maybe I won't get done with this message. I'll have to finish it next week, but we'll see how that goes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Verse 1 of chapter 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hither to ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? The message this morning is three kinds of people. Three kinds of people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we do pray that you would please... Help us in, in understanding the scripture. Lord, may it take root in our hearts that we may be able to apply it by your grace and your strength and help. And Lord, I pray that we would uh, just truly grab hold of these. May it just uh, penetrate in our hearts where it needs to. And Lord, uh, may you accomplish all that you desire. May the preaching of your word go forth clear and plain uh, that you would be uh, glorified and pleased by it in the, in, through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Three kinds of people. A kindergarten teacher gave her class a show-and-tell assignment of bringing something to represent their religion. The first child got in front of the class and said, My name is Benjamin and I am Jewish, and this is the Star of David. Second child got in front of her class and said, My, my name is Mary, I am Catholic, and this is a crucifix. The third child got up in front of his class and said, My name is Tommy and I am Baptist, and this is a bucket of fried chicken. Now, actually, the original, I think, was this is a casserole. But apparently, I think even Methodists take credit. They'll claim the casserole, too. But Baptists, Baptists will claim the bucket of fried chicken. So you've got to get it right here. Um, three kinds of people uh, illustrated there. Now, much more importantly than that uh, is the three kinds of people that are described here in 1 Corinthians. Now, I have already touched on the natural man. The last couple of weeks, we've read these verses. Verse 14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the first man here, the first type of person, is the natural man. And what is natural? That means it's pertaining to nature and the flesh. If something's natural, it's it's earthly, it's from the earth, it's of the earth. Uh, that's all it's about, is, a, is the earth. This is a lost and unregenerate man. This is someone who has no spiritual life in them whatsoever. They are spiritually dead. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. And so all they have is 
the things that pertain to their natural, most base desires and thinking and nothing spiritual in them, nothing of the Spirit of God, no, no life. That is the condition of every lost, unregenerate person. When they say un, someone's unregenerate, they're, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. They've not been made alive. They've not been quickened. That is the natural man. And so it should, become, should come as no surprise when the natural man, when the lost and unregenerate men and women, human beings, live that way. They live of the earth. They live according to the dictates of their own flesh, of their own earthly desires, because that's all they know. That's all they can know. They have no ability to know the things of the Spirit of God. You know, they, they pick up a Bible, and, and really, unless it's pertaining to the things of salvation, they're not going to be able to apply the things of the Bible and the, and the things of God's Word are not going to, God's Word is not going to speak to them in the same way that it would speak to a saved person because they're dead. They, they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth according to the Word of God. That is the condition of lost man. And so until that person is convicted of their sinful condition, their need of salvation, and believes on Jesus Christ as their Savior, and, and that they're born again by the Spirit of God, um, all they have is the flesh. Don't expect anything different from them. That's the natural man. It says, neither is this in verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the spirit, things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Don't be surprised when lost men, lost women, think it's just foolishness as far as following the Bible. They, they just can't comprehend, wait a minute, this is right and this is wrong and this is what the Bible says, this is how... It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's Greek to them, so to speak, you know. Uh, our Bible's not in Greek, it's in English, but it may as well be in Greek to them because it's just, it's not, a, there's no comprehension there. You know, all they can think of the natural man who is trying to gain favor with God by his works, once again, his works are of an earthly sort. You might have some good works, but there's nothing in and of themselves that can gain favor with God in their lost condition. Romans, 8, uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 8 and 9 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But, he's talking to Christians here, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so the distinction between those that are in the flesh and in the Spirit, that's the way it's worded in Romans. Now, in, in Galatians, it's, in Galatians 5, it says, though we walk in the, or, no, not in, not in Galatians, actually, I think it's in uh, 2 Corinthians, maybe. For though we walk in the flesh, we war not after the flesh. Now, that's a different use of the word in the flesh. We walk in the flesh, meaning we are fleshly beings. We're made up of flesh. Uh, but that's a different usage. But here in Romans, when it says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, that is talking about their, their position in light of, in, before God, in relation to God. They're in the flesh. They're not in the spirit. They do not have the spirit of God dwelling in them. And that is, for someone to belong to God, they must have the spirit of God dwelling in them. Now, that's the danger of, this, of the New Age teachings of, you know, we're, you know, we're all just kind of at one with the universe and there's a life force. And so you can kind of vague, like, well, there's a little God in all of us and, and those type of teachings uh, really waters down what the clear teaching of the Bible is. And it, and it actually not only waters down, it's in complete opposition, disagreement with the teaching of Scripture that is either you either have the spirit of Christ or you don't have the Spirit. And the, re and the only way you do is, is through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. It's very cut and dry. Not everybody has the Spirit of God or a little bit of God living in them or part of God. That is, that is absolutely not true. The natural man. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So a person must have the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God. The Bible also says that if a man doesn't have the Son, if a person doesn't have the Son, he doesn't have the Father. So there may be some who say, well, I believe in God, I worship God, 
do you have the Son? Have you believed on the Son? Well, if you, if you don't, haven't believed on the Son, well, you don't have the Father. You can claim to believe in God. You can claim to worship God. But you don't have God. You're not part of God's family. You're not a child of God. That is the natural man. The second type of person is the spiritual person. Look at verse uh, let's go back to verse 10 in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. How is it that we can understand the things of God? Because we have the Spirit of God. There is a Spirit of the world. There is a certain way of thinking. There is a certain influence. There is a certain uh, force in the world. But it is not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is a person. The Spirit of God comes to dwell in us at the time of salvation. Uh, in verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. If we're going to understand spiritual things, we have to be spiritual because you've got to use spiritual means to understand the spiritual things of the Bible, things of God. And then that's when it says, but the natural man receiveth not. But in verse 15, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For we have known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. But then in verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. So what is spiritual? Spiritual is a born again person. But not only only born again, not only does the Holy Spirit dwell in that person, so we're in the spirit, positionally. But also the spiritual person is guided by and filled with the Holy Spirit. So not just saved, not just born again of the spirit, but spiritual is being guided by and filled with the Holy Spirit. Being spiritual is what allows us to properly exercise the mind of Christ and have good judgment. Well, look who the snow dragged in. Amen. <laughs> or I guess look who the snow blew in. Good to see you this morning. I'll cut this out of the video, don't worry. Okay. And there's a, a little bit of a hold up out in Gill. Oh, was there? I wasn't sure how long it would take to, because the, the police and everything were already there. So ah, okay. okay. All right. Well, glad you're here this morning. The spiritual person is, is the one, being spiritual is what allows us, is, is in verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Being spiritual is what allows us to properly exercise the mind of Christ and have good judgment. If you're going to have good judgment in your life, in the Christian life, if you're going to be able to think the way Christ wants you to think, you've got to be a spiritual person. You've got to be born again, but you also need to be filled with and guided by the Holy Spirit. So there's the greatest contrast is between the natural man and the spiritual man, the natural, unregenerate, lost man, and then the spiritual that is filled with the Spirit. Being completely without the Spirit, being filled and guided by the Spirit are two diametrically opposed positions to be in. And so the second type of person is the spiritual, the spiritual person as opposed to the natural. Then we come to the third one. The third one is what Paul is addressing here a little more in detail. Actually, he addresses the natural and the spiritual more in detail at the end of chapter 2, but then he gets into chapter 3. He says in verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, 
but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is for whereas there is envying among you, I'm sorry, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So Paul is dealing with, he's, he's trying to tell them, there's things I need to give you. There's things, there's, there, there's a way that I would like to speak to you and things I'd like to show you. But he said, I can't speak to you as, a, as spiritual. I can't speak to you as people of this church, as church uh, that, that I can't speak to you in such a way uh, of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by the Spirit, having the mind of Christ, operating with the mind of Christ. Now he's, he's making these, he's giving these principles in chapter two, but he turns around and tells them, I couldn't speak to you as a spiritual person, as spiritual people. I can only speak to you as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. And what is carnal? What is a carnal person here that Paul is describing? A carnal person is born again. They do have the Holy Spirit. They are in the Spirit as opposed to in the flesh. But they're living in pursuit and or under the influence of things that feed fleshly desires. They're being led and controlled by the flesh. They're feeding the flesh. The flesh is what is being satisfied in their lives as opposed to being led by the Spirit of God. Now, there's a phrase that a um, fairly well-known popular preacher says, uh, that he says, there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Let me just tell you right now, that's a bunch of baloney. Now, the reason he says that is uh, this guy's a hardcore Calvinist, and so he believes in perseverance of the saints. And, the, and perseverance of the saints does not mean eternal security. Some people think perseverance of the saints means just simply eternal security. Once you get saved, you... You're, you're always saved. That's not what perseverance of the saints means. Perseverance of the saints, according to Calvinism, means that if you are truly saved and you fall away, you are guaranteed that you will come back to where you should be in the Lord. That's perseverance of the saints. And so if a person falls away, even if a person's made, made a profession of faith and they fall away and they go live an earthly, sinful, wicked life, and they never come back before the end of their life, there's a good chance they aren't saved. They may very well not be saved. Now, the problem with that doctrine is that it's, it's, it's making too hard and fast of a rule there. Because the fact is, there are people who have made professions of faith, and then they go out and just live like the world, and they never did get born again. So in some regard, that is true. But it is not true that every person... Uh, who has, has been born again, and they go away and they go live in the flesh, that this, they're just automatically going to come back because there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. That is absolutely not true. And you just, all you got to do is read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and Paul says there are carnal Christians. Paul says these people that are saved are carnal. And so you can either believe what just a nice catchy phrase that a man says, a preacher says, or you can just believe what the Bible says and says, yes, these Christians are carnal. These believers are carnal. Are they acting very Christ-like? Are they acting like Christians? No, they're not. But they're still believers and they are carnal. There's three types of people. There's not just simply the natural man and the spiritual man. And if you're saved, you're always going to be coming back to the spiritual. No. Why is that? Because we still deal with the desires of the flesh. We still deal with that propensity and that tendency to do what is good for us, good for our flesh, and not what is according to the Spirit of God. And by the way, the, the, the preacher who said that, uh, that uh, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian is Paul Washer. You might have heard of him. But uh, anyway, he's a good preacher in some regards. There's a lot of, he, he preaches really hard, straight, direct, and there's a lot of things I agree with. Uh, but he makes this comment, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian, and that is absolutely not true. He himself said at the end of one of his famous messages, uh, that uh, just it was a very powerful message, he said, even at the, he said at the very end of his message, he said, you know, they're basically, he's not even sure that he's saved. Because, I mean, he might fall away and he, he might never come back. So 
It's, he's saying, it's possible I wasn't saved. Thinking, what a twisted, perverse thinking for him to preach the gospel, for him who says he believes the gospel, but yet somehow he can fall away from the faith and go out and do all these sinful deeds and live this life. And he's saying, I might not even be saved. I mean, who knows? That is, by the way, that is a backdoor work salvation. Because he's saying that somehow his works might have some place as to whether or not he's saved. Now, maybe he would disagree with that because he'd probably say, well, that's just the evidence I'm not saved. So I, I understand the evidence part. But to say there's no such thing as a carnal Christian, that's wrong. Because the fact of the matter is, and that's why I said this is such an important message as far as these principles here in, this, in these verses, in this passage. As I said, it's not an important message because I'm preaching. It's an important message because of the passage of Scripture it is. And is that this is the war between spirituality and carnality that every Christian must recognize. You must recognize its reality. You must recognize its importance. And then you need to engage. You need to fight in that battle. And the best place to be is to recognize, you know what? I might be, I'm, I'm, I might be saved. I'm, or I, 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 you, you may be saved. You say, I, I know I'm saved, but I still recognize that for my life, there's always a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. That's the best place to be is if you, even, if you recognize that reality. And I'm finding, you know, there are a number of believers who just... Um, don't live with that thinking. They don't live with that thinking. They don't live with that awareness that there is the battle between the flesh and the spirit. But if you live, if, if, if Christian is living without that awareness of the flesh and the spirit, you're missing most of the battle in the Christian life. Because that is the key battle for the Christian. It's not a battle for your salvation anymore. The Lord doesn't have to, to convict you of sin for you to recognize your need for salvation and call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. No, that, that is already done. That's already settled and sealed. So what the battle is, is for you, for your life to be pleasing to the Lord, is to recognize the battle between the flesh and the spirit, the spiritual and the carnal. It is a war. It is a battle. Now, we cannot fight that battle in our own strength. So don't let me don't, don't get so overwhelmed thinking, oh boy, oh, this is just so overwhelming. No, we, the only way you can do it is by the grace of God. The only way we can overcome, the only way we can succeed is by the grace of God, by His help, by His strength. Spirituality and carnality are completely opposed to one another. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. You know, there are, there, there are people who... Christians who do not seem to get victory in the Christian life. They think, why, why am I not living the victorious Christian life? Why do I keep struggling? Why do I keep having these same problems? Why do I keep... That's the importance of recognizing this battle that is at work in your soul between the flesh and the spirit. And then when you recognize the battle and you know how to engage, you know what to engage in, then you can start to have some victory. But you can't win a battle that you don't even know what you're fighting. You don't even know what you're facing. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. So in other words, you know, a saved person, you, you don't have the condemnation that comes through uh, uh, as far as the, the sin, the law of sin. You've been freed from the law of sin and death. You now no longer have to go to God and be there before God as a sinner and be condemned for that because you've been made free from that because Jesus Christ 
took that upon himself. It says, in the likeness of uh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So Jesus paid for sin while he was in the flesh. While he was uh, actually here in human form, he took care of sin in the sense that he paid for all sin so that we wouldn't have to be condemned. If a person who believes on him is not condemned. But interesting, at the end of chapter 1 it says, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The presumption is that someone who is in Christ Jesus is not walking after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That is God's intention. And there's a difference between being in the flesh and in the Spirit and walking after the flesh and walking after the Spirit. That's a direction in life. Which direction are you pointed? Which direction are you going in life? Are you going after the things of the flesh? Are you going after the things of the Spirit? Uh, in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be filled in, uh, fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So those who are walking after the Spirit are the ones who are the accurate representation of what Christ has accomplished for us. The ones who are walking after the flesh are not an accurate representation for what God intends in the Christian life. Verse 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, now notice uh, the complete opposition to one another here. In verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Those, those two things are opposed to each other, the flesh and the Spirit. And God's intention is for Christians, those who have been set free from sin. You have been freed from sin. But that does not mean we don't deal with sin in this life, but sin does not have dominion, have a place in our lives, does not have a right to have dominion over us, because uh, it says, I think later, it may even be here in this, uh, uh, in this chapter, maybe back in chapter 6, we are not in the law, but under grace. The problem is, here's where the, the carnal aspect of the Christian life comes in. You say, well, if, if I'm not under the law, but under grace, and sin doesn't have dominion over me, or shouldn't have dominion over me, well, then why does sin seem to have sometimes dominion over me? Because there are avenues in our lives that we allow these things to come in to feed the flesh. There's some sort of fleshly desire, some sort of fleshly appetite that is demanding to be satisfied. And when it says in verse, uh, verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So when you are going in that direction, that is where your mind is going to be. That is where you're going to pay the most attention to, and you'll be most aware to feeding the flesh as opposed to minding the things of the Spirit. And the, the subject of the mind, and I, 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 I can't go into detail, but I, I just can say I've been through my own battle this past week, and I've, everything that I already knew, I just had resurface in my mind, as far as knew in the Bible, had resurface in my mind and say, you know what, once again, God's not kidding around here as the importance of this stuff. And, and, and the, the subject of the mind is, is, is kind of a different subject in itself, but it also ties in with this. So I can't preach on the mind right now because that, that would take us too far, too far out from where we are today. But I think some point we'll get there. But the carnal appetites and what we keep our minds on make a big difference whether or not we're going to go after the things of the flesh or after the things of the Spirit. So the direction we're headed, that's where our mind is going to be. But the spirituality and carnality have completely opposed one another. That's why there's such a great battle in the Christian life. And I don't want you to get the idea that, you know what, well, I'm perfectly half and half, and there's the good side of me, and there's the bad side of me. No, your spirit is completely sealed. 
you are in Christ, you have been declared righteous on the basis of what Christ has done and on the basis of His righteousness. His righteousness has been applied to your life. So in God's sight, as far as your position before Him, you are complete. And the Bible says you are complete in Him. So is, as believers, if you're saved, you are complete in Him. So it's not just like a 50-50 thing in our spirit where, well, we have the bad side and then I have this good side. No, you have a complete good part of you not good in ourselves, but it's the part that Christ has sealed and cleansed and washed. And, and the, the part that is uh, declared righteous, that's our spirit. That's our spirit. That's the most innermost part of us. That's the part of us that is either dead in trespasses and sins or it's been quickened, made alive. That's the spirit part of us. And I should say, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 this says we're made up of a spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is what gets saved. Your soul is where this spirit and flesh battle takes place. Your spirit is already sealed till the day of redemption. And your body is what you use to either, you know, the, the body is what you use that either reflects your spirit-filled life or your flesh-filled life. So those are the three types of, of people, three kinds of people. So in, in that sense, in the, in the sense of before God, those are the three types of people that are in this world. Natural, spiritual, and carnal. But I want to take some time and also uh, give you some ways how to wage a good warfare against the flesh and walk in the spirit. Okay, so we know, okay, natural, spiritual, and carnal, but what, how do I actually go about this? And I'm sure based on the, the breadth of uh, of wisdom in God's Word. I'm sure there's a few things I miss here and there, but that, that's why you need to be in the Bible and be reading the Bible, studying the Bible for yourself, because there's things that I'm just not going to cover every single thing when it comes to a topic or a passage. But you get in the Bible yourself, you'll start to see the pieces connect, even if it's not a verse that I have read or a point that I've made. How do you wage a good war warfare against the flesh and walk in the Spirit? Number one, Love God, not the world. Love God, not the world. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, oh, first one mentioned, lust of the flesh, all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, you can't love the world and love the Father at the same time. You cannot have proper love for God when you are in love with the world. And you know what's wrong? With, you know what carnal Christians are? They're people that are in love with the world more than they're in love with God. That's just the bottom line. And we can try to go into all these details and psychologically and all these things and figure. The, the bottom line is carnal Christians, at that time that they are carnal, are loving the world and the things of the flesh more than God, the things of God. Now, I should note, uh, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, I could not speak unto you as unto, car uh, as unto spiritual, but unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. So he's comparing carnal with being a babe in Christ. It makes perfect sense that if someone is newly saved, someone's recently saved, they haven't grown, they haven't heard the preaching and teaching of God's Word, they haven't been grounded, that yes, they're going to look more carnal than a more mature Christian. There's going to be a lot of things of the flesh that they're going to have to deal with throughout their Christian life that for some it's just a, 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 just a huge turnaround almost instantaneously. And then there's others, it's a growing process. So we need to recognize there are different aspects of this, that there are the carnal that are, um, there's, there's the carnality of people who love the world, and then there are those who may just be babes in Christ. And then there's also the carnality of people who truly want to live a spirit-filled life. They, they rec you recognize the battle. You recognize the situation. You recognize the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And you want to win. You, you, you truly love the Lord and you desire it, but you, sometimes you just give in to that flesh. There's a difference between those types of people 
those type of people just need some help, need some strengthening, need some reproof and accountability and, and, just, and just the Word of God and, and some of these things. So that's one. But then there are people who are just make complete excuses for the flesh that just really don't see it as a big deal at all. That's another, that's another matter. And so when we say about carnal, when I say carnal Christians just simply being in love with the world, you know, that's the crowd that is just loving the world so much and yet trying to do it in the name of God. And say, well, we're trying to reach the world, or we have liberty in Christ, or whatever excuse they might make. That's a huge segment, a growing segment of so-called Christianity today, is this the loving the world. And uh, why? Because the world is great at feeding the flesh. That's all it knows. And when the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, it's not talking about the way, you know, for God so loved the world. It's not talking about that. It's not talking about us, excuse me, it's, talking about, it's not talking about us uh, not loving people, not having compassion on people like Jesus had compassion. That's not what love not the world means. Love not the world means the world here. It means world system. It means the order of this world. It means the things that are associated with this world, that we should not love those things, love this world system. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't have compassion on people, love them like Christ loved them. But it does mean we should not love this world system, the things pertain to it. Because the world system is built to feed the flesh. The world system is built to gratify the flesh. And when we start to recognize that we can guard ourselves, we can keep ourselves more protected from being sucked into the things of the world because we know that the world is based on fleshly things that's based, built by natural men who are experts at appealing to the flesh. Experts. Love God, not the world. We need to love God you know, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We cannot properly love God and love the world at the same time. And, you know, and, and so, you know, you, you might have had these battles. I've had these battles. There's times when, you know what, I love the Lord and I want to serve him. But even, even when during that time that I am giving in to the lusts of the flesh, I am not loving God like I should right at that moment. I might still love God, I might still have the best intentions in mind, but my allegiances are shifting, my affections, I should say, are shifting. Loving the world. That's why you know, Colossians uh, says, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Love God, not the world. Second way to wage a good warfare against the flesh and walk in the spirit is yield your body to God. Yield your body to God. Romans chapter 6 uh, and verse 12. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to read these verses just a page back from where we are, a page or two. But first, uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. You know, God's saying you have a choice. You have a choice as to what you're going to yield your body, yield your members, that's the parts of your body. You can, you're, you're, we're told not to yield our members as instruments of unrighteousness. So in other words, we're making the choice that we are not going to allow our, part, our bodies to be used for unrighteous purposes. We're going to yield ourselves to God as, as those that are alive from the dead. In other words, when you yield yourself to God, it's just simply a reflection of your spiritual identity, your identity in Christ. So that just should be yielding ourselves to God, should be a natural outworking of who we are in Christ. That it's not some great and mighty thing. Wow, look at that great spiritual Christian. He's, uh, he's yielded to God. Wow, look at how much. No, that's God's intention for every believer. That we would be so consumed, so filled and led by the Holy Spirit, we've, we've yielded ourselves to Him. 
Uh, let me go down and read um, verse 15 in Romans chapter 6. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Strong wording. Strong words from Paul there. You mean, so that goes, that flies in the face of the lovers of the world crowd, the carnal crowd that, oh, we have liberty in Christ. We're under grace. I mean, how many times has that been used to justify fleshly sinful things? Oh, we're under grace. He says, should we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. God forbid. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but have ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. He's saying this is, the, this is what your identity in Christ looks like. This is how it looks like when you're living it out, that you're servants of righteousness. Why would you go back and yield yourselves as servants of unrighteousness? doesn't make sense for the Christian. Yield your body to God. Number three, third way to wage a good warfare against the flesh and walk in the spirit is be a fruit inspector. Be a fruit inspector. Now, not a fruit inspector of other people. Now, there's a lot of people are good at that. Oh, I don't see the fruit in their life, and you know, you can point the finger, I don't see the fruit. There's times we have to make certain judgments about people, so we know, we can tell, are we dealing with a carnal person or a spiritual person? But you know, the first one we need to inspect the fruit is ourselves. We need to inspect ourselves. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. I'm not going to break up this message into two parts. I'm just going to go for it. We'll, we'll finish it today. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5. Like I said, I could, I could preach this next week and it would be just as fresh and just as, as relevant and important as today. Because this is such a crucial topic in the Christian life, for the Christian life. Yeah. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 this I say then, now actually go back to verse 15, but if ye, divide, if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. That actually sounds similar to what they were doing in Corinth. That sounds like, you know, one saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos, and they're going after each other, they're having allegiances. So what's the tie in here? Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. At the moment you are filled with the Spirit and you're walking in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, it is impossible to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You can't fulfill the lusts of the flesh when you are controlled by the Spirit. The only times we fulfill the lusts of the flesh is when we give ourselves over to fulfilling those lusts of the flesh. And we push aside the Spirit, grieve the Spirit, quench the Spirit. Verse 17, now I'm not preaching sinless perfection here. I'm just saying, at the time we're filled with the Spirit, at the time we're walking in the Spirit, we're not going to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's the importance of having a Spirit-filled life. Verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. When you, for the, I was thinking, you know, what does it mean? The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Well, what is lust? What's well, desires? In other words, the desires of the flesh are contrary, they're opposed to, they're against the desires of the things of the spirit. The desires of the things of the spirit are opposite, contrary to the things of the flesh. He says in verse 18, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, why is that? Because when you're led of the Spirit, you're, you're far above the law. You don't have the law coming down on top of you saying you're guilty, guilty, guilty. That's what the purpose of the law is, to show our guilt. When you're filled with the Spirit, grace takes you above the law. It's a higher standard, actually, and it's, but it's by the power of God, not our own righteousness. Now, the works of the flesh, and, and this is a whole other set of messages if we were going to cover all these, but let me just read through these. Verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, because the point is here, be a fruit inspector. So what fruit do you see related to the flesh? What fruit do you see related to the Spirit? Now, by the way, the, the, the list of the fleshly works, the fleshly fruit, is much longer than the fruit of the Spirit. 
Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication. Now there is a reason that those are at the top of the list, I believe. God doesn't do anything by accident. What is, what are some of the greatest sins that are committed and what are the, some of the greatest uh, sins that are promoted in Hollywood and pop culture? Adultery and fornication is everywhere. Everywhere. And that is at the top. And p partially maybe because it's of great offense to God because it violates His creation of marriage. And, of course, then the comparison between Christ and the church related to uh, marriage. So that may be why, uh, you know, whatever reason, they're first. Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If those are the things that, that, identif that a person is identified by, if that is their identity, if these, this list of things, they don't have a part in the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean that we, a, a saved person can never commit one of these sins, one of these works of the flesh. It means that just simply doesn't define us. But those that are natural, that's all that they have to define them. And verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Be a fruit inspector. Look at verse 24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Difference between position and practice. We have a position in Christ that is in the Spirit. Because of that, in light of that, let's walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Uh, I should mention here, and uh, I didn't plan for this to be part of the message, but I should point out Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So if someone's overtaken in a fault, it takes spiritual people to help that person who's overtaken in a fault, not carnal people. They're of no help. Carnal people are of no help to someone who's overtaken in a fault. But you know where a person who's overtaken in a fault and they're dealing with the flesh and they're dealing with carnality, you know who a lot of times they look to? Oh, they find camaraderie in people who are also carnal and fleshly. Then somebody whose who's spiritual comes along, the very least is, is, is given the Word of God and, and the principles that they need. And, uh, well, you know what? The carnal crowd says, oh, you're just legalistic. So, but anyway, it takes a spiritual person to help one who's overtaken in a fault. And by the way, once again, if there's a person who loves the Lord and, they, and they, you know, they're overtaken in a fault, we, don't, we shouldn't necessarily look down upon them because he says in verse 1, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, it says in a spirit of meekness. Realizing, you know, I'm not, if I'm going to help someone, I'm not this high and mighty person who is just immune from the works of the flesh and these faults. No, I need to be meek about it, realizing I myself could be tempted to do the same thing or even other things. But we need to be spiritual. If we're going to help people, we need to be spiritual people, filled with the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, operating in the mind of Christ, having the right judgment. Be a fruit inspector. Uh, number four, identify the area of your life that is open to the flesh and what you are allowing. Also, identify what you are allowing to feed the flesh. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 through 14. Romans 13, starting in verse 8. O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So if you love others uh, as you love yourself, uh, you're not going to commit adultery, you're not going to 
uh, steal, covet, do things against them because you wouldn't do that to someone you actually love properly. It's just not going to happen. Same thing if we love God like we should. We're not going to do those things in opposition or offense to God. Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his no neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We must identify if we're dealing, if we see some fruit in our lives that is on the fleshly side of things and not the spirit side. We must identify the area. What area of my life is open to this? What area of my life is susceptible? And for each of us, it could be something different. We all have different weak areas in our lives. Very much. But everybody does because we all deal with the flesh. Nobody's immune. Nobody's exempt. Nobody has arrived. Identify the area of your life that is open to the flesh. And then what am I allowing then to feed that flesh, to gratify that flesh? He says here, make not provision. You know, and when our minds are getting after the flesh, when our lives are going after the flesh and we're minding the things of the flesh, it's much easier to make provision. We just know what we need to gratify that thing of the flesh. He says, make not provision for the flesh. Don't even prepare for it. Because the more you're prepared for it, the more you have in your life that makes this more possible, you, you'll be fulfilling the lust thereof. But he says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's, an, there's a positive to this, not just casting off the works of righteousness, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be Christ-like, live like Christ. Recognize your position in Christ. Number five, need to keep moving here. Number five, practice separation. Now you can identify the area of your life. It is open to the flesh and also what you're allowing to feed the flesh. This goes along with making not provision for the flesh. There are some lines that have to be drawn in the sand and say, you know what, I'm going to separate from certain things in my life. By the way, the carnal Christian crowd hates the idea of separation. That's what they call legalism. That's when you draw a line in the sand and you say, you know what, this is right and this is wrong. I can't have this in my life. I need to draw a line so I can live a spirit-filled life. You know, oh, you must, you're just legalistic. Oh, you're just, uh, you're just, uh, uh, you know, you're living under the law. You're, you know, whatever the, the, the excuses are, whatever the accusations are. No, it's just when someone practices separation, it's a matter of protection. I want to be filled with the spirit more than I want to be fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. So I got to separate from some fleshly things that are not good for me. They're going to lead me down the wrong path. And by the way, I can speak from personal experience. It takes just a little bit of something fleshly that can then lead you into bigger fleshly things. Anybody else identify with that? It doesn't take... The, how do people get into big fleshly things? It started as a little fleshly thing. Something, somewhere in their life, there was something opened up and it, 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 with, because it wasn't dealt with, whether or not they recognized the battle, maybe they didn't recognize the battle they're facing, maybe they didn't take the right steps to deal with it, maybe they didn't recognize, know what they were dealing with, whatever it may be, it, it, it blossomed into something bigger. And that's the danger of this world system is the world system always has more you can get into. Starts with something small and it goes, grows and grows and grows and there's no end to it because the world has something for everybody. I mean, the thing is, your own flesh tells you it's got something for you. <laughs> your own desires of your flesh. You don't even always need the world's help. It's, well, oftentimes, it's just the flesh. We deal with our own flesh. We can't always blame the world. But we have to recognize the world is there to help feed our flesh, not to help us walk in the Spirit. So we need to practice separation. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter 4, verse 1, it says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, 
arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. I should continue on. I was just going to read the first six, but let me read verse seven. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. It's also in, in uh, I believe, First Peter. I don't remember the exact uh, reference, but uh, be sober. Oh, it's right there in front of me. First uh, Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But I notice here separation. Verse, in chapter 4, in verse 3, for the time past, that's before salvation, before they trusted in Christ. The time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. In other words, the, and the focus of Peter's epistles was to Jewish believers, which is why you know, it's, it's making the distinction with the Gentiles, Gentiles being the lost uh, people who didn't have the gospel, didn't believe the gospel. When we walked in lasciviousness, so this is past tense, lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine. By the way, excess of wine doesn't mean just that a little's okay and it was just drinking too much was the problem. It's, it's referring to drunkenness. Revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Are there things like that going on today that the world partakes in? All the time. I mean, we live in a party culture. People just love a good party. I mean, next week, next Sunday is St. Patrick's Day. Who's, uh, there's going to be a lot of excess of wine, excess of alcohol. There's going to be a lot of drunkenness. There's going to be reveling. There's going to be uh, lasciviousness. There's going to be lusts and banquetings. Now, the, the word banquetings here apparently has to do with getting together for the purpose of having some drinks and, and uh, you know, just getting together for that. That happens all the time, just according to the normal course of this world. But notice for the Christians, it was the time past. But it says in verse 4, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot. Don't be surprised if the world thinks you're strange for not doing the same things that they do. Don't be surprised if the world thinks it's strange you know, that you don't ever go out and have a social life having a few drinks. Don't be surprised if the world thinks you're strange for not partaking in you know, the Mardi Gras celebration. <laughs> I mean, that fits these verses perfectly. The reveling. New Year's Eve, reveling. Just people like a good party. That's the opposite of what God tells us to be. He tells us to be sober, be vigilant. Uh, and, then it's, and it says, even speaking evil of you, and it says, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? They're going to give an account. Everybody's going to give an account. They'll be without excuse. Practice separation. The enemy has many tool, tools in his toolbox, and separation is an important way we protect ourselves from his devices. The tools of the devil are limitless. And the, the, here's the thing. It's important that we know ourselves and what our weaknesses are because guaranteed the devil knows your weaknesses. And if you don't recognize your weaknesses and set up the right boundaries, he's going to exploit that. He's going to take advantage of you. And before you know it, you'll be in the flesh. You'll be after the fleshly things. So we need to know ourselves and our weak areas and say, you know, I, I better be careful. I better be careful. I need to set up some boundaries here for my protection. Separation is not meant to be holier than thou. Oh, I do this, and, but you don't. 
you do that and I don't do this, you know, I'm holier than thou. That's not the purpose of separation. The purpose of separation is simply, I want to live for God and live a spirit-filled life, and so I need to protect myself. I want to please the Lord. So there are some things I just can't be a part of. But that's what's being celebrated in churches, things of the flesh being celebrated and promoted in churches and in the Christian life. And how much preaching is done on the difference between walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Oh, there's probably some that would say, oh yeah, definitely don't commit adultery. Definitely don't commit fornication. You know, there's a lot of other things regarding the works of the flesh. That works of the flesh is a pretty long list in Galatians 5. And then number six. Sixth way we can wage a good warfare, warfare against the flesh and walk in the spirit. Fill your mind and life with the right things. Or I could even say fill your heart and life with the right things. Fill your mind, heart, and life with the right things. Turn to Philippians 4, 8. This will be our last verse today. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. It is important when you do separate, when there are things you just simply do not do because you're a Christian and you want to please the Lord and you want to protect yourself and you want to live a spirit-filled life, it's important that we recognize that we can't just empty ourselves out. We've got to be filled with some things. This makes the difference. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, now I'd encourage you, think about this verse. Maybe sometime this week or every day this week, look at this verse again and try to tie it to some things in your life or maybe that are, you could potentially be in your life. And say, does this actually line up with this verse? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. That is what God's intention that we have our minds filled with and dwelling on are the things that are true, honest. Notice, true and honest are separate. So true is not just simply the absence of a lie, the opposite of a lie. Honest is what is opposite of a lie, something that's honest. How would, how would, you, how would you apply true? Well, there's a... Uh, I don't think we have the book in our library. It's actually an ebook form. I don't think I got the paper copy, but I have it in ebook form. There's, uh, uh, Brother David Cloud wrote a book called Fantasy Dangers. And there are many people whose minds get wrapped up in things that are not true. And so their minds then dwell on things that are not true, and then the things that are not true get set up as things that are true, and that becomes more reality than true reality. Let me give you an example. How many have ever shed tears or had, a, had a, an emotional time when you've watched a TV show or a movie? Anybody ever had that happen? Yeah, we can be honest and raise our hand. It's okay, be honest. Yeah, it's all right. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. He wasn't being honest. He didn't raise his hand. <laughs> or you, he didn't hear. He was, his, mind was, his mind was somewhere else. His mind was somewhere else. That's okay. If, as long as he's thinking about the message. If you're pondering the message, it's okay. Um, no, we've all had that happen. And then there's time, and I'll be honest with you, I have had times where not only is it in that moment you have that emotion, but it lingers with you. And it's a powerful, powerful force. And it's always been for the negative, it's always been with negative effects, not positive effects, on my emotions, on my mind, on my life. And I don't even, I mean, as a family, we don't even, we don't show our kids movies like that or TV shows. I mean, we have some things we allow the kids to watch, but I notice a difference in my emotions and my heart when I'm watching a documentary as opposed to a fictional television show or movie. And part of it is the documentary is just giving you facts. It's giving you truth. At least, hopefully, if they did their research properly, it's truth. And so I notice a difference. Wow, my mind feels different. My emotions are different when I'm watching a documentary as opposed to this. And, and there was a time we had some DVDs that would be considered, you know, wholesome, clean, 
family friendly. We had these a number of years ago, and they were based on a series of books that were just, you know, they, they just wholesome, clean, supposedly. But my wife and I would watch these things, and I would notice, you know what, there, it's, it makes us emotional. And it's all fictional. I'm getting my emotions worked up over something that is not true. And you know, when people, when, when, if people fill themselves, now, now I guess for me, I notice it more simply because I guess if you've gone a while and you don't watch a lot of television, you don't watch a lot of movies, you're more sensitive to it. So when you do take those things in, you notice it more. I, I've noticed that. But think about people filling their minds all the time with that. No wonder people are emotionally strung out because they're allowing these things that aren't true to affect them emotionally. And then it strings us out emotionally. Then we don't have the proper emotions available to deal with real life. That's just, and that goes back to the mind, the whole subject of the mind. But uh, whatsoever, this, that's an example, the difference between true and honest. I mean, it, when, when somebody makes a TV show or movie, we're not saying they're lying to us. They're just making something that's fictional. And even things that are based on a true story are still fictional in, in, at the heart of it. It's not all true. And so we need to fill our minds with things that are true. And I tell you, that's, that's convicting thought. Also, it's, it's, we also then, on not just things we watch, but also books we read. I don't read a lot of fiction anymore because... Uh, I find I get, I do get, and maybe this is just me, how my mind works. Maybe you're not this way. I do get emotionally invested and connected with a story. I mean, I picture myself there. I, you know, empathize with characters. I just, I, I, it's just the imagination. The imagination can be used in a great way. But we have to be careful about the fantasy aspect, about the not, things that are not true, that we protect and guard our hearts and minds. Notice verse 7, actually just right before that, speaking of hearts and minds, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I notice that when I go through human emotions that are based on real life events, the grace of God is there to sustain me, to help me. You know, you go through emotions and there's nothing wrong with that. I've noticed when I get it, my emotions are affected and my mind is affected by things that are not true, things that I have willfully placed in my life that I've allowed to enter my mind, I do not have the same experience of the grace of God being available to help me through those emotions. You know, oh, my favorite character died in this TV show. Lord, would you please help me deal with this grief and this sadness? Forget it. <laughs> Forget it. You know what? And, and what I always come back to is if God were telling me something directly, he'd be saying, just cut it off. That's how I'm going to help you deal with it. Cut it off. Get your mind filled with something else. I, I'm human just like you are. We deal, I, I, as Paul said, I'm of like passions. I think it was Paul that said that. I'm of like passions as you, or maybe Peter said it. I forget. I think Paul said it. I'm of like passions. We deal with it. We deal with the flesh. Fill your mind and life with the right things. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That, if we take that verse to heart, it's a long verse, but it's packed full of things. If we take that to heart, it should affect what we bring into our minds and our lives. It should really affect it. It should make a difference. And that will help us walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you have never believed on Jesus Christ and called on the name of the Lord for salvation, you are a natural person. There is nothing you can do to gain favor with God in your current condition. Recognize and admit that you are a sinner and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are saved and filled with the Spirit, stay yielded to the Spirit's control and recognize that the battle is not yet over. There will never be a place in your life that you are, you, you've arrived before we get on the other side, before we get to be with the Lord. Then we'll have arrived, we'll be perfected, we'll be completed. I mean, we are complete spiritually now, but in our whole being, in our whole person, will be completed on the other side. If you know you are saved, but are walking after the flesh, repent of your fleshly living and get on the road to living a spirit-filled life. 
We need to repent of some things. There's things I need to repent of at times. Say, you know what, God, I need to get back to the Spirit's control, yielding myself to the Spirit's leading to what I know is right. Lord, help me to separate from these things. And all of us, once again, have the weak areas. And they might always be weak areas. We may never have a time in our life where they're not a strong area for us. We have some other maybe strong areas, but we also have weak areas. We need to recognize those things. We need to be honest with ourselves and with the Lord. God's grace is there to help us, and we want to go after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Now, I know I packed a lot into this message, but I just felt led that I needed to just bring it all today. Three kinds of people, natural, spiritual, and carnal. Which one are you? Which one are you? Do you need to be born again? Are you natural? Are you spiritual? Now, be careful if you think you're spiritual. Uh, let him that think of thee stand to take heed lest he fall. So yes, do the fruit inspection and be honest, but be humbly honest if you're spiritual. <laughs> Don't get puffed up thinking, oh, great, I'm spiritual actually. Wow, wonderful. No, be careful because that means the flesh is right around the corner. The devil's got something for you right around the corner. Or are you carnal? You know, and unfortunately, many times for many Christians today, that's... I'd hope we're not perpetually carnal. I hope we're going in the right direction, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But you know, so many times we deal with carnality in the flesh. But let it not be said of us that, you know, what we can't handle, the weightier things in life. I, I, I meant to, uh, to address this verse. Um, and I won't have you turn there because I already told you the other one was going to be the last verse. But... Uh, but I do need to read this. He says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. So one of the effects of being carnal is you can't handle the meatier things of God and his word. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. He says, you're still not able. He said, before I was, you know, I had to feed you with milk. You know, milk's important. Milk for a baby is important to be nourished and get that initial nourishment. But there's a time to get to graduate from that. Yeah, you still take in milk. And even in the Christian life, we still, take in the, we still take in milk. I like milk. I especially like raw milk. Delicious stuff. It's great. And it's very nutritious. It's got, a, it's got a lot of great fatty acids and good enzymes in it and all that type of stuff. Oh, it's great. It's great. I'm going to get you a, just the face you made, I'm going to get you a container of that. No, it's actually not for people who have, weaker immune systems because there are times it can have bad bacteria in it. But when they pasteurize, it kills not only the bad bacteria, it kills the good bacteria and the good enzymes too. So anyway, if it's, if it's raised right though, it shouldn't have bad bacteria in it if, if the cows are raised properly. Um, but anyway, that's off the subject. But the point is, milk is great all throughout life, but there comes a point where you just need some meat. I mean, there are times, you know, I'll live on things that it's more lighter foods and it might even be grains, and it might even be... And then there's just a time I have a desire. You know what? I want something heartier. I want a burger. I want a burger. I want a steak. Amen. <laughs> and that's a healthy desire. It's, but, you know, if all you lived on was the meat, that would get to be too much. And if all you lived on was the milk, it's a healthy balance. And that's what it is in the Christian life. But Paul's saying, all I could do is give you the milk. I couldn't give you the meat. May it be, may we be spiritual people so we can grow, not just taken in the milk of the word, but the meat as well. And be hearty, grounded Christians, strong Christians living for the Lord, humbly, with meekness, realizing we can always fall. We can not, not ever think we've arrived, but let's be able to be in a position where we can take that meat in.